When I think of Niagara Falls, I think of zip lines, big crowds, boat tours. But I've only recently learned about the literal life and death dramas that happen there at an upscale hotel on the American side of the border. They served five course meals. They had marble fireplaces. It was an experience for people. It was called the Cataract House. And inside? It's like a, a spy story. A secret resistance cell rescued enslaved people. Cecilia and her silent guide slipped out the garden gate. Success lay in secrecy. Now archaeologists are digging deep to bring these legendary stories back to life. So we're hitting a layer here. My name is Anthony Morgan, and it has been my life's obsession to find ways to use science to improve the lives of communities. So when I found out about this dig, I was really excited to see how it could help. It's only through a discovery of what's buried in the ground that we can tell the story, the authentic story, of the Cataract House. This is something that movies are made of. Archaeology amazes me. It digs up these seemingly unconnected echoes from the past and pieces them together to tell incredible stories. It's like being able to time travel. Now, archaeologists are harnessing this power to uncover evidence of forgotten heroes who played a crucial role in the Underground Railroad. Back in the 1800s, communities came together to help freedom seekers cross safely into Canada. Evidence of that activity might still exist today, buried underground. This is a beautiful location. You, of course, know where we are. Yeah, well, to the average person, it's just a park, mm -hmm. right? Um, to us, it's hollow ground. Saladin Allah is a teacher and local community historian raised in Niagara Falls, New York. This was a stop along the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a pivotal stop on the journey to freedom for a lot of people, right? You know, this is the actual location where the historic Cataract House once stood. Right. This was a location that they oftentimes had to come through. Thousands of enslaved people fled to Canada. Traveling through Niagara Falls was a good way to do it because of the narrow river gorge and the nearby suspension bridge, but also because of this gigantic hotel. It was called the Cataract House. The Cataract House was one of the most important destinations or locations in terms of underground railroad activity and was one of the most active locations in terms of providing assistance for people who were seeking freedom. Wow. Flash forward to 1945, and a fire destroys the Cataract House. Its history is buried, forgotten, until now. Okay, so orienting ourselves based on this map printout, we have that It was leaders from the black community in Niagara Falls who revived the story. They pulled in archeologists and historians to excavate the buried ruins of the Cataract House. The city of Niagara Falls has a lot of Underground Railroad heritage, and it was very important to gather those of us who are vested in a part of that heritage and history to make sure that we're in a position to be able to control that narrative and to be able to shape that content and to present it to this world. Douglas Pirelli, an archaeologist from the State University of New York, organized the excavations. The goal is to relocate the Cataract House to the degree possible. The foundation of that building, I think, is an important artifact that people should learn from and see with their own eyes. So it's all, all this history just beneath the surface. Just beneath the surface. It looks like just, here's some wood too. It's a hotel foundation that is lost to history. My interest in the project is bringing that authentic story back to the public view in the location where these things actually happen. 
unearthing the remnants of this Cataract House Hotel, um, not only will it allow us to rethink history that has um, been buried for many years, but it also gives us a sense of pride knowing that our city was a place that people came in order to obtain freedom. But the Cataract House didn't seem like a site of underground resistance. It seemed more like the lap of luxury. So what are we heading into now? Uh, so this is the Cataract House Hotel. You know, they served five course meals. They had um, velvet curtains, marble fireplaces. They had musicians that would play. It was an experience for people. The Cataract House opened in 1825. Over the years, it expanded to become as big as a city block, boasting opulent rooms for 200 guests. Many of the wealthy guests who stayed in these rooms were enslavers from southern states, and they would regularly have enslaved people as their servants. What's astonishing to me is that they had no idea that in the kitchen, free black white staff planned and executed dangerous rescue missions. There were laws that if a person got caught assisting a freedom seeker, they would risk up to six months in jail in a thousand dollar fine at that time. That's the equivalent of nearly 50,000 Canadian dollars today. Being part of a resistance against slavery came with a cost, but to them, it was a risk worth taking. When it comes to slavery, we're only given the, the largest examples of resistance and, and people fighting back against the, the, the system of slavery, such as uh, Nat Turner's rebellion. But the truth is there were everyday acts of resistance. Resistance can mean how people actually took their lives so they wouldn't have to, to suffer in this, in this system. People poisoned um, the food of the, their, their enslavers or, or masters. Um, there were refusals to work. Every step along the way, people who were enslaved were not just settling for it. Many enslaved people resisted and organized their own escapes. Some helped to liberate others. That resistance movement became known as the Underground Railroad. The success of these Underground Railroad operations lay in secrecy. The Underground Railroad was the first freedom movement of the Americas. It required secretive communication. It required connections. It required meeting with people surreptitiously in order to convey information. It required the interaction, the cooperation of people who had a similar view about freedom. It was neither underground nor was it a railroad. But like a railroad, it stretched across state lines, helping enslaved people escape to free states and to Canada. Freedom seekers who made it to the Cataract House may have traveled hundreds of kilometers. Here at Niagara Falls, they could see Liberty just across the river. So when you look at the location of Niagara Falls and other different um, cities that are on the Canadian border, these are likened to sanctuary cities of the past. And in the sanctuary of the Cataract House, there was a leader. His name was John Morrison. John Morrison was the head waiter at the Cataract House Hotel. Um, one of the things is the reason why we have an idea of what he looked like is because one of the guests of the Cataract House actually thought to sit and draw a picture of John Morrison um, at one point. Morrison hired the wait staff at the hotel and he made them the best in town. He also helped them become skilled underground railroad operatives. The wait staff at the Cadaveric House, who were all African American men, led double lives as secret underground railroad agents. So imagine the precision service that they would have to provide for guests here, but then also operate that precise, active part of the underground railroad. Right. Amazing. The Cadaveric House, um, this is like a, a spy story, right? It required a lot of wisdom on their part, um, not only in that service position but to live that double life as secret underground railroad agents. And for a person like John Morrison 
to organize all of that. Man. This is something that that movies that that movies are 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 made of. Um, these the storylines, like the story of Patrick Sneed, a waiter who escaped from slavery on the Underground Railroad. His descendant is historian Anthony Cohen. We're standing here at a very special spot. Where are we right now? So right now we are um, at the uh, uh, foot of the falls uh, here at Niagara Falls. This was the place where Patrick Sneed, my great-great-granduncle, fled down to board a boat to cross over into freedom. Cohen recreated part of Sneed's 1,500-kilometer escape route from the south. Patrick Sneed was an enslaved man from Savannah, Georgia. In 1996, I walked uh, from Maryland to Canada. Two years later, I did a second journey uh, from Alabama to Canada. And that's when I discovered his story and that I had actually not only followed part of his route, but had been in the same locations he had escaped to. Sneed escaped to Niagara Falls, then became a waiter and part of the resistance at the Cataract House. But one day, Sneed himself needed help. In August of 1853, Patrick is performing his uh, uh, regular duties, and authorities arrive with a warrant for his arrest. A U.S. deputy marshal and two constables arrived to grab Sneed. Believing the officers were there to capture and re-enslave him, the other waiters sprang into action. They ran with Sneed to a ferry at the base of the falls, desperate to get him to safety across the river in Canada. But the marshals yelled that Sneed was a murderer, and they threatened to arrest the ferryman for helping him. So the boat returned to shore, and Sneed was captured. At his trial, Sneed was declared innocent, and after being set free, he made his way to Canada. I think one of the most interesting things about this story is the bravery um, that it depicts from uh, Patrick's fellow uh, waiters at the hotel. They poured everything they could um, into not only helping Patrick, um, but others before him and others after him. This is parkland setting. There's been a lot of pedestrian traffic. The cataract house remains buried. Some of the artifacts of interest may be pretty close to that top layer, so. But Pirelli is determined to locate the kitchen, which historians believe is the headquarters of John Morrison's resistance. I don't see a building. Uh, you know, to my eye, I see no evidence that the Cataract House ever existed. Thousands of people walk through this park every week and walk over the Cataract House Hotel. It's one of the reasons they put the historic marker up, so people could have a better awareness of the history underneath their feet. After the fire in 1945, the construction of Heritage Park meant there was virtually no trace of the Cataract House. And now, the site is surrounded by roads and sidewalks. The urban setting is particularly difficult to work in because of these cycles of construction and demolition. Uh, and that's uh, just a, a reality. Uh, in a remote setting, it's very comforting to just be able to dig and sift soil and look for artifacts. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is things that are visible through the grass on the ground surface. Okay. What do you see here? I see what appears to be a rock, but I suspect you're gonna tell me that it's more than that. It is more than that. This rock is very probably a fragment of the Cataract Hotel Foundation. Here's a fragment of brick. The multiple chimneys that you see in the historic photos of the Cataract Hotel were probably manufactured from brick in contrast to the stone that was used to make the walls. And you're seeing both of these building materials here. So there's a good chance this is from the Cataract House. There's a good chance. This is very likely out of place, not in its original position, but this is very likely a fragment of the foundation of the Cataract House. Like just below the surface. Just you don't even have to dig. Just below at the surface. To look beneath the surface of the park, Pirelli needs some high-tech help. 
like ground penetrating radar, x-ray equipment, and 3D laser scanners. In some ways, these various technologies have revolutionized the field. Through their use, you are able to discover the presence and location of something. What it doesn't tell you is what that something is. You still have to dig it up to find out what it is you're dealing with. But even with modern tech, can Pirelli uncover this community's lost history? Uh, Once I get this cleared out, yeah, you can see. Yeah, so we're hitting a layer here, and you can hear it. Over 150 years ago, a luxury hotel in Niagara Falls, New York, doubled as a station on the Underground Railroad. It was called the Cataract House. The story of its waitstaff and the resistance to slavery is an example of timeless struggle. It's human history. This sort of cooperation and conflict has continued since the dawn of time and is, is very much um, reflected in this story of slavery and freedom. Pirelli and his team have excavated this site before. Excavations were very much geared towards what even is left. Uh, we knew that the hotel stood there above ground. We were not as clear as what its substructure was and whether or not it was completely removed when it was demolished in the 1940s. And that is why we're one of the reasons that we're continuing this work. If someone wants to start setting up the test unit form, Heather Lacos led the team that unearthed the first hints of the hotel's foundation. So, Heather, this is it. Yeah, this is a wall of the former Cataract House Hotel. Amazing. What is it like to be back here? So it's great to be here again, working at the site. This was the site that got me into community archaeology. The idea for this project came from within the black community of Niagara Falls. And I know that the community was also involved in, in getting this dig started in the first place. They were, right? yeah, yeah. So that's um, a big part of community archaeology. Nowadays, archaeology is very much in the public eye and serves the community. The foundations of, of archaeology are very much racist foundations of misconceptions about things like, you know, the intellectual capacity of black people or Native Americans. And so, what began as rich white guys traveling around the world and collecting things to fill their cabinets of curiosity today has become a rich science with a, a very profound cultural sensitivity. But take a look at this object here. I've got two pieces here, and I honestly can't tell them apart. What am I looking at? Well, the piece on the left is a fragment of pearlware from the Cataract House excavations, and the piece on the right is a fragment of pearlware from our reference collection. And if you can read the, age, the production ages on the back. Right, this is from 1779 to 1830, so that's right. when this would have been made? That's when it would have been made, but that production age puts it in play for being an object that would have been in use at the Cataract House before the Civil War period. Amazing. Another thing that we found are these fragments of whiteware. Now, these are especially interesting to me because I recently toured the Underground Railroad Heritage Museum mm -hmm. in which they have a dining room display, and there's a picture on the table in that museum that's made of very similar material as we found here. And so right. that's, yeah, that's exciting to me to think that we're finding some of the fragments of the dishes and plates that would have been used in the cataract kitchen. But it suggests to me that we're near or around the kitchen. Is that a reasonable, like, guess? I think it is reasonable, and that's certainly our hope, and we'll, we'll, we'll truth test that further with more excavation. Well, I can't wait to find out, yeah. It's only through archaeology and the discovery of what's buried in the ground that we can tell the story, the authentic story, of the Cataract House, where it's positioned, where it was historically, and what it meant to people. They think the kitchen is the headquarters of Underground Railroad activity at the Cataract House. If we could find the walls of the kitchen as bounded space where all of these activities occurred and to give people an opportunity to go to that space and think of what it was like 150 years ago, I think that would be a very powerful experience. Knowledge is the foundation of wisdom. 
You know, you can't make wise decisions if you don't know anything first. And gaining that wisdom, you also have the possibility of understanding or seeing things for what they are, not what they appear to be in this society. The kitchen may seem like a mundane space at first, but it could be where Morrison and the waitstaff secretly plotted to save freedom seekers, like Cecilia Jane Reynolds. A month before Cecilia arrived at the Cataract House, April 16th, 1846, a man came there to make arrangements to help Cecilia get away. Carolyn Smarts Frost is a leading scholar of Underground Railroad history. Her biography of 14-year-old Cecilia Reynolds helps us imagine a moment of resistance on a dark night at the Cataract House. This is my vision of how Cecilia escaped from the Cataract House. Cecilia and her silent guide slipped out the garden gate. Behind them loomed the huge stone bulk of the Cataract House Hotel. Most guests slept. The dark-clad man led her to the river's edge. Three hundred stairs led down to the bottom of the gorge. Following her guide's swift descent, she counted every one. Strong hands lowered her carefully into the sturdy craft. Fifteen minutes it took to cross. She turned back towards the river, but he was already pulling away. All of this epic spy craft, rescuing Cecilia, defending Patrick Sneed, all of it may have happened in the kitchen. To find out, Pirelli's team plans to open up even more of the ground. Where are you thinking we should focus? All right, so the main area of interest is this rectangular shape you see here in the middle of the structure. That's a two-story kitchen that was added really within our, our, our period of, of significance and interest here, 1845 or 1846, and uh, that's where the waitstaff would have had a great deal of activity. Um, are we able to dig up the whole park? Is that we the plan? Can, no, we are not allowed to dig up the whole park. Heritage Park is a busy place in an urban setting there could be underground cables, pipes. Pirelli has to choose his location with near pinpoint accuracy. How do you figure out where to dig? There are ways that we can get clues to that before we dig. There are a number of techniques that we can use to examine the ground surface, cameras on tripods, and even LIDAR and other satellite imagery to try to pinpoint the location and the walls and the position of that former hotel within the state park. Today, we're starting with ground penetrating radar, or GPR. Okay, so this is gonna help us look just the right distance down into the earth to find where there would likely be walls of the cataract house. Exactly. How does this thing work? What we're looking to do is we are sending out a signal. It goes into the ground. That electromagnetic wave will pass through different materials at different speeds. And so when it changes that speed, it is gonna kick back a little bit of that signal. We're going to be moving the, along the ground, and we're going to be seeing it in real time on this screen. Okay, so in this display here, will it, it literally, literally look like a wall in this? It will look wall-like. Okay, How's that's, that? that's good enough for me. I'd love right. to see it. All right, here we begin zooming in on where we are for the Cataract House in Niagara Falls, New York. As we zoom in further, you can see all these lines. These are where we did the transects for the GPR. Okay, so given that we're trying to find aspects of the intact portions of the Cataract House, I'm looking for linear reflections in the radar data. A linear reflection is a line of points on the map, and it could indicate a concealed wall. In other words, pay dirt. And I think I see an opportunity here um, for, a, for a linear feature. I believe that a portion of the foundation of the Cataract House exists and is fairly intact. What did the GPR data tell us? So you can see the outline of the building, and then we took the GPR data and put that on as well. So you can see from the GPR data, it lines up pretty well with where the walls are on the Sanborn map. Okay, and so how do we translate what we see on this map to where we are in the real world? We are actually right about at the spot where we're supposed to be. We should be standing over where the former kitchen was of the Cataract House Hotel, here. 
here. Yep. So we're standing right above a point really important in the black resistance against slavery. This is hollowed ground. It is. We're about to break ground here. How do you feel about it? Um, it's a lot of pressure, to be quite honest. Um, when you work with a community like this, uh, you can tell how important these excavations are, so I really want to be able to deliver to them what they want. If I could stand in uh, the trenches and, and feel and just touch some of the vestiges of the Cataract House Hotel, um, I think uh, many things would come full circle for me. Um, not only being a part of history, but being a caretaker and an ambassador of that history. Again, telling our story from our perspective. All right, guys. So we want to put the two one by ones right here. We want them running north to south. So just make sure we have enough space to set the two up, OK? 141. Yep. To better help you go toward your future, you need to understand the past. If we're ever going to move forward um, as a country, as a society, these are things that we need to know about. Finding the kitchen is the goal. But even if it's discovered, it can't be easily removed and displayed elsewhere. If you think of the Cataract Hotel as a structure, it's not something that you can put in a museum or in your pocket. Yeah, these will be 10 and 11. Something like a spoon, however, is. It's an object that you can hold in your hand that would have been in that space. Uh, and that's something that could be extremely powerful. More than that, it could help them zero in on the location of the kitchen. It's pretty crumbly. I might be able to it's break through It's pretty crumbly, it. yeah. All right, he's brushing it off now. It's becoming more visible. Is that right? It could it be. Is. We'll see yeah. when it comes out. This is so exciting. Heather, is that what I think it is? It is. Amazing. in Niagara Falls, New York, are digging to reconnect this community with a piece of its history, the buried ruins of the Cataract House Hotel. GPR scans suggest the kitchen walls might be right here. And now another clue has emerged from the dirt. Heather, is that what I think it is? It is. What we is that? found a fork. Unbelievable. Yeah. What does that mean? I think that means that we did our job correctly and we did end up somewhere between the kitchen and the dining room. I was so nervous. There was a chance when we were digging we might not be in the right spot. This is so exciting. It is. It's believed that the Cataract House kitchen is where John Morrison planned the escape of freedom seekers trying to reach Canada on the Underground Railroad. GPR provided clues. But does this artifact help pinpoint the kitchen's location? I don't want to get my hopes up here. This could be just a fork that somebody was eating lunch, they lost it maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago. How do we know that this is from Cataract House? So the depth is a pretty good indication because it's a little too deep for something that recent. And then we do have it right next to some of the structural debris. Why can't I just pull it out? Like, I mean, I would like to pull it out. A you lot. would. <laughs> you <laughs> need self-control. <laughs> we can't do that because of the way we excavate. So right now we keep everything in 10 centimeter arbitrary levels. Since this fork goes into the next level, it'll be removed then. Okay. Hopefully there will be something in that level that'll give us more of an indication of it being from the Cataract House. That would be a portable object that we could take and save. Our mission here is to find an artifact we can save for the future, we can show to the community. Exactly. I'm gonna take a look at the underside of this. There's very often a stamp in that. Can you see what that says? Says Stainless USA. Stainless USA. So we know that this is a fork made from stainless steel in the United States of America. It's quite light. Uh, the edges are a little bit sharp, so it is stamped from a sheet of stainless steel. That technology came into existence in about 1921. Okay. So this object dates to after 1921. Okay. 
It's a major setback for the team, but Douglas Pirelli still has hope that the kitchen can be found. But it's a fork from a place setting that functionally represents the kitchen space. Right. Part of the kitchen, not part of the period of prime significance. Okay. That period of prime significance is from 1840 to 1863. Those are the years before the end of the Civil War when John Morrison's resistance cell was active and saving lives. At some point, you'd imagine people would start catching on. Was there any sense that the jig was up, that people were starting to figure out what was happening here? That's what's amazing. Retired history professor Judith Wellman investigated the forgotten past of the Cataract House and its stories of rescue, exactly all of which were centered around the waitstaff and the kitchen. In a 19th century newspaper, she found an article containing a warning about the resistance cell. The source? An enslaver named James Evans. As early as 1841, James Evans, his wife, and some children come to the Cataract House. They bring with them a young teenage girl who helps take care of their children. And one night, they send this young girl down to the kitchen. In the kitchen, the girl meets with John Morrison's operatives. They sneak her out of the hotel and across the river to Canada. Evans rounds up other guests and pursues her. East of the falls, he finds her, protected by a black family. Evans demands she return, but in Canada, the young girl has the power to say no. She stays, he goes. So we don't know what became of her? No, we know nothing. We don't even know her name. Isn't that sad? And he never sees her again. Wow. He goes home, and in the New Orleans Picayune, which is the major paper in New Orleans, he publishes an article, and he says, the proprietors of the Cataract House have in their employ a set of free Negroes as servants who have a well-organized plan to carry off all slaves. If you're thinking of going to Niagara Falls, do not go to the Cataract House because you will lose your property. We found the copy of the article, August 14th, 1841. She was only 14 years old when she left. And hopefully she had a good life in Canada. Yeah. The people who were actually running the station didn't get caught or charged or jailed or anything. It was an amazingly successful operation. The Cataract House was responsible for the safety of maybe 2,000 people, maybe three. John Morrison was a very, very smart man. Back at the dig, Heather's team zeroes in on the kitchen. Like a, a ruler? Uh, no, I'm actually using what's called a leaf trowel. When you're excavating a really delicate context, you don't want a really stiff trowel. And so we use a softer trowel to kind of preserve this area. And pottery tools reduces the pressure from something like a leaf trowel. And so I can interchange this stuff depending on the context that I'm in. You're a lot further down now. Have you found anything? We're starting to get more of the walls. Watch that wall. It turns out the GPR was a good lead. There is a wall here. Even better, it lines up with Heather's historic map showing a two-story kitchen and dining room, possibly divided by this same wall. So what does that say about our guess? I think we're doing pretty good. Have we found anything that might lean us one way or another? We've been pulling out a lot of ceramic, a glass dish, Little things like that, but those are used in both the kitchen and the dining room area, so right. it doesn't really point to one or the other. I'm still not 100% sure of which we're in. Could these artifacts be clues to the location of the command headquarters? This piece of molded glass, can you see the different colorization there? It's kind of rose-colored. Also, if I, I tip it over, there is no kind of maker's mark here, but there is a pattern, and so it's, it's difficult to tell. Uh, when that was molded or made, but uh, we can do additional research to determine that. This still has some soil in it from the excavations because we didn't want to, we didn't want to mistreat it or scratch it up in any way. This is possibly a serving bowl for ice cream or a dessert in the restaurant area. 
what about this? Now, this is a piece of plaster that has a finished coat on it, so it would be from the public space in the hotel. If we take all of these things together, mm -hmm. what does it tell us about where we are? It tells us that we're in or near the kitchen space. We're on the right track. We're on the right track. But are we getting closer to the buried kitchen where John Morrison organized his Underground Railroad resistance? Doug, this piece of this with the gray on it is metal. Oh, yeah, there you go. I found glass. What did we find? Ooh. It's been amazing having a front row seat to history as archaeologists uncover the Cataract House Hotel. Now, they're zeroing in on the most important goal for the community, the kitchen. It's believed to be the headquarters of a black resistance that helped enslave people escape to freedom in Canada. I'm so excited. Can you pass the bucket? Yeah. Field director Heather Lacos is at the threshold of a major breakthrough. What were you trying to figure out? Right now, we think we're coming down on an area that was possibly a doorway. But where does this door lead? Yeah, it sounds like metal. Now, if we just shift this map, Matt brings this doorway right here into this excavation area. And look at the unfinished wall. It's not got clean plaster on it. That is a finished wall. And it's interesting that the end of the finishing ends at the threshold between the public space and the, the more private workspace that you don't need to finish because your guests aren't seeing it, which means we found the kitchen. This is incredible, we did it. Yeah, we've done it. We found the kitchen, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> They've found the headquarters of John Morrison's resistance. With the evidence we have, and as we've gone along, kind of the evidence is stacking up. Yeah, we've got the location information based on the map overlays. We've got kitchen-related artifacts, the excavation depth, the landmarks that we have in and around the park, and the superimposed Sanborn map over an air photo of the park. I think that's a very realistic interpretation of what we're witnessing here today. It's really cool. How do you guys feel about this? Did you think we would find it? Uh, I hoped we would. I didn't want to disappoint. <laughs> it's a proud moment. Lacos, Pirelli, and their team set out to reveal a community's lost history, and they delivered. Well, I'm really excited with what we get to show you today. You can step on this wall here, it's pretty stable, and then we've got to step down. This is the discovery Saladin Allah and others in the black community of Niagara Falls have been hoping for. And would you like to know what you're standing on right now? This part right here? Yes. Yeah. This is the threshold between the dining room to your north here and the kitchen of the Cataract House. Mm. Yeah, I'm speechless. It's different to tell these stories mm. than to, to literally be in the space. It has a different uh, weight to it. That is probably where a door frame was. So all of the staff would have came through here continuously. Yeah, this is literally like a, a, a portal or a path from one world. What does it mean to you that you found the space between the luxury hotel and the, the staff's quarters? We've literally found yeah. the location where John Morrison was at, yeah. where Patrick Sneed was at, where all of these people literally walked through. You know, it's... Could not have been more accurate. Allah's mentor and black community leader, Bill Bradbury, was the person responsible for bringing historians and archeologists together. Mobility issues prevented Bradbury from being at the dig, 
But without him, none of this would have been possible. It's my responsibility to be here for him, you know? But he would be excited. He would be thankful. He would tell people, I told you so. <laughs> So even if we wanted to stop digging, he, he, would, he would not. He would not let us stop. I'm gonna reach out to him as, as soon as uh, as soon as I can, just to let him know that that his vision is still alive and and we found you know what he's always looked for. <laughs> Let's get this started. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've got the paperwork. It's right here. The dig site can't be left open forever. To preserve the find, Pirelli is turning to a powerful technology called LiDAR. It uses infrared lasers to create an interactive 3D model of the entire site. What I'd like for you to scan is everything from the sidewalk area in that trench over to this excavation unit here. LiDAR is a technique where you can really, really get a, a highly detailed, fine-grained view of what the topography of the ground surface is. The result allows for some really interesting possibilities. We can take steps to recreate that building in some way in that location. There's some kind of holographic image or, or three-dimensional image of the hotel that, that people could have an experience walking through. People can tour this project and the archaeological excavations in the future long after we're gone. Absolutely. People can find a location, click on it, and they can be as if they were at that location looking at it like how we're looking at it right now. Amazing. For too long, things like the Underground Railroad, the story of chattel slavery has been taught as specifically black history. And the truth is, it's everyone's history. So I think it's very important that now we start to kind of pull back the curtains and, and deal with these difficult periods in history, because I feel like that's the only way that we're truly gonna heal and actually move forward. I have seen the emotional impact of archeology span up close and personal firsthand. The technologies that made this possible are only getting better. I, for one, cannot wait to see the surprising ways that the tools of this incredible field of science can help communities in the future. The Cataract House reminds us that sometimes history is hidden in the most familiar places. The waiters and chambermaids and porters and cooks and kitchen maids, all of whom contributed to the cataract house that made it the single most important underground railroad station on the Niagara frontier. They're courageous, they're upstanding, they're capable. Aren't they superheroes of their day? There's a direct connection of events from the past to different events, especially around issues of social justice that are going on today. The environment that we're in now as, as a country, as a society, people are finally wanting to know more about this, this story, this history. I think about that in the, the Cataract House, about John Morrison, and I'm excited about what the future holds. As I look at Niagara Falls today, it's with a newfound appreciation for the forgotten stories of its many unsung heroes.